screen now. And should I share my screen or if you, should I wait? Um, maybe just introduce you. So yeah. just check yeah. whether the stream is starting. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is the uh, latest of the machine learning for um, science uh, uh, seminar. And uh, today, so we're going to have uh, a, a new topic for the series and it's the topic of uh, uh, retrieving information from uh, literature. So it is my big pleasure to have, uh, uh, and it's also a little bit unusual in the format because we are going to have two speakers that are going to play a tag team um, in the seminar. So it's a, it's a big pleasure to have uh, uh, today uh, Peter Marie Rust and uh, Matthew Dumston, um, who are both from uh, uh, the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge. And uh, uh, both of them has been working for quite a while now in uh, uh, developing methods to retrieve information from uh, uh, essential online sources, if I, if I can say. Um, and I think uh, 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 Peter has always been a very, a very long-term advocate of open science and uh, sharing of information. So I think it uh, would be very uh, interesting to see also that aspect uh, uh, of, uh, of the data retrieval. So I guess without any further ado, I would like to uh, kick off the seminar. Ah, sorry, forget to mention. So, um, so because the seminar is divided in two parts, please uh, write the question as it comes to your mind because we might, is there a question, we may take a break between uh, the two, the two parts of the talk. Um, so we can have a, a first lot of questions after the first, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. All right, with any further ado, um, very, uh, you're very welcome and please let's go ahead. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I'll just start sharing the screen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, to, oh, gosh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, to be part of the seminar, and uh, I really should thank uh, Peter mainly for um, getting me into this field. Uh, I'm going to give a very sort of brief introduction to the sort of work I'm doing and how that kind of led me into this collaboration with Peter. So I'm a postdoc at the University of Cambridge within the group of Professor Claire Gray. Uh, and uh, in the group, mainly we focus on uh, battery research, um, synthesis and, and analysis using solid state NMR, X-ray diffraction and other sort of techniques. Uh, I'm a little bit on, on the side of, uh, of all of that. I've been interested in materials informatics. Uh, and, and to me, uh, materials informatics has sort of many different definitions. But uh, I like to think of it as how you use existing data um, that's available either in the literature or in other sort of databases, uh, whether that's structures or results of theoretical calculations, derive new insights into functional materials. So uh, I've worked in, uh, in fuel cells, uh, in carbon capture, in various different ways of, de of developing new materials with, with particular properties. And my PhD actually was uh, looking for new carbon capture materials, utilizing an online database called the Materials Project, which is a uh, a storage of, of many uh, DFT calculations, which I could then use to simulate uh, potential materials to uh, absorb CO2 at, at high temperatures. And that kind of got me along the path of, of this materials informatics idea. Uh, yeah. A little bit after that, uh, I started looking at uh, how phase formation in batteries uh, proceeds by looking at structural similarity between phases that might form. Uh, and now uh, in the group, uh, so uh, Claire is the head of one of the uh, main thrusts of the Faraday Institute, which is, is a large sort of multi-university uh, project in the UK, uh, looking at various aspects of battery research. And this particular, um, this particular uh, uh, thrust is looking at battery degradation. Uh, so just a brief sort of insight into what we're sort of interested in. Uh, and I should say that uh, this work is being done, uh, is the work of Ben Smith, who's a, a PhD student and also in the group. Uh, we're interested in, in this particular battery material, uh, which we call NMC811. It's just really a code. Uh, the commonly used material, one of the original materials uh, that you find in batteries is lithium cobalt oxide. Uh, but there's a lot of interest to try and reduce the amount of cobalt uh, in battery materials, mainly uh, due to both cost and toxicity. Uh, and you can replace some of that cobalt with either nickel or manganese to various different ratios. And the code just reflects basically the amount, the relative amounts of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. So in this case, 
Uh, this is a very nickel-rich material. And it's very promising because it, it's capable of higher voltages. Uh, however, you have some problems in that you have a great capacity loss over multiple cycles. And, and really what we're trying to do in the project is to understand what's the origin of this degradation in this material, how does it occur, and what are some of the sort of structural features they're telling us about that degradation process. Uh, so with, with our research, what we're trying to do is to use data to give us new insights into this degradation process. And what we're trying to look at is look at electrochemical cycling data. Uh, so in the most simplest format, it's, it's current versus voltage. To try and look at features in that data that might tell us, give us some way of predicting uh, the future health of a battery. And there's sort of two main um, components that we're trying to predict. One is a state of health estimation. So this is the idea that if I took, uh, say, a battery that I had in a car, and I put it uh, into some sort of analysis, uh, can I tell myself how healthy is that battery? How close is it to failing? Um, and, and that might tell me whether I need to replace it or not. And so related to that is, is this remaining useful life estimation. So it's like, how long can I keep using this battery before I need to uh, replace it? And we're using machine learning methods to essentially link to see if we include uh, these signatures that we see in the electric level data, does that improve our predictive cap capability of these two quantities? Uh, just to give you a quick look at the data, uh, so this is um, some preliminary analysis that Ben was doing on a commercial data set, uh, which is um, 28 commercial lithium ion cells. So they're at hopefully as close to each other in terms of composition and manufacture, so you, you have the greatest amount of consistency. And these are cycled in a particular way, and that allows us to essentially uh, look at, uh, so the bottom plot here is your sort of typical uh, uh, a voltage capacity plot. And, and some of the main features that you see in the, these voltage capacity plots is you, uh, you see uh, plateau regions and sloping regions. Um, I'm not really going to go into that much today about what they mean, but, but they are signatures of particular processes happening in the battery. A plateau tells you usually you have a, a, a particular two-phase reaction happening. Uh, whereas uh, a sloping region means that you've got varying chemical potentials as you, as, you ch as you charge the battery. And what we're trying to do is to see what uh, features we can get from this data that we can use in, uh, in, in our machine learning algorithm. Uh, and so sort of initial results were looking at uh, actually the derivative of this, of this particular of these plots, uh, which is known as sort of DQ to V. And they churn these plateaus, which are what I, what, I said uh, represent these two phase reactions, they become peaks in the DQ to V. And, and actually this peak is one thing that we can automatically extract, uh, both the sort of full width heart max maximum and the actual voltage position of the peak. And this can give us some insight as to how the pro that two phase process is changing as we go through multiple cycles of, of the battery and in, uh, across, indeed across different battery cells. Um, and just to cut up a long story short with some of these results is that, yes, including features from, from the electrochemical cycling data uh, does, in fact, improve model performance over just simply looking at what is the capacity over the first, say, 30 cycles. So, so previous work sort of looks at if I cycle my battery for 30 cycles and I have that data and I, and I know the capacity retention that I have, I, if I just use that uh, in a, in a uh, machine learning algorithm to then predict the capacity out to uh, multiple more cycles, uh, you get a particular performance, but if we include, uh, if we augment that capacity uh, feature with features from this DQ to V plot, we actually have an improved performance in the predictive capability. We have a lower uh, error, as you can see in this blue curve, is essentially the the error, uh, the number of days out from the initial uh, from the data that we already use. So it's how far out you're sort of predicting from your known data, and the blue curve, which is both capacity and features from this DQ to V. Uh, has the lowest error across uh, going out uh, more days. But, uh, and this is sort of where uh, Peter and I sort of uh, got to working together, is that uh, the difficulty is actually there's not a lot of uh, easily accessible electrochemical cycling data. In fact, to produce your own data set, um, which I would say even over a moderate number of cells, you know, when we think about machine, machine learning, you know, you want at least in the hundreds, if not thousands of, of measurements, but even having 100 cells and say 100 cycles of each of those cells uh, can take months, you know, and that's a, that's a fair proportion of anyone's uh, project. 
Uh, and the existing data sets that, that are available are limited. So for example, this NASA data set that we're using only has 28 cells, and that's only of a single material, of a single uh, manufacturing method, of a single processing method. And uh, if we want to really be predictive, we want to not only look at capacity, we want to look at what are the effects of different additives that we might add to the, to the cell composition or different materials that we're using. Um, but on the other side, actually, in the last few decades, there's been a huge explosion of battery research. Uh, uh, and this, the most ubiquitous type of data are these uh, current voltage plots, which are sort of underpin uh, all the things we're trying to extract um, in, in our processes. So it would be great if we could essentially access all the data that's sort of locked up in the literature. Uh, and that's sort of how we got working with Peter, um, who I think is now going to talk about uh, sort of how that <laughs> how that side of things work, but that that's sort of the motivation of why uh, why we got sort of involved in this project. Uh, so so that's me done. Uh, just a very quick acknowledgement. Uh, so uh, so this a lot of this work is is, is Ben's uh, PhD project, and of course thanks to uh, Claire Gray who's who's uh, supervising the whole project, and and Chow is is another postdoc in the group who's collected some of the uh, battery cycling data uh, that we're working on. Great. Um, oh. Okay, can people hear me? Uh, yeah, looks looks okay, yeah. Okay, I just have to find out um, where the... Now I've lost the thing that... Uh, this is my slideshow. What I'm just trying to do is to find... Uh, so you can see, see and hear me okay, right? Is my Are my slides up there? No. Okay, that's... That's what I have to find. Um, we had it before, didn't we? Mm. And um, I have to find the Skype somewhere or other. It's um. Uh, the uh, PowerPoint's taken over the whole thing. Um, let me just... Oh, right, you can... Um, this is always happening in this uh, new and exciting world. Uh, okay, you okay. can... Um, I'm doing that sharing. I'm going to switch screen. Uh, so... Um, can you see my slides yeah. now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'll make them full screen. Uh, is it? When you want things to disappear, um, present of your play from start. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. So you can hear me and you can see my slides. So, uh, first of all, this is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's quite a long time since I came to um, uh, Trinity College Dublin. I was in Ireland um, last year in um, Galway, which was fantastic, talking about um, health care and, and so on. Um, uh, and uh, I'm looking here, among other things, uh, to offer you things which, if you find them useful, I'd be very happy to collaborate on. So, um, as Matthew's mentioned, uh, machine learning's valuable, but it's only valuable if you've got something to learn about. So, um, without data, machine learning can't, really can't do anything. And this is one of the big limitations at the moment, uh, is a lack of data. Um, there are several reasons. Scientists don't actually think about machine learning, uh, so they put it out in forms which aren't very useful. Uh, secondly, um, many people want to restrict the flow of scientific information to make money out of it. So a major problem, as we'll see, is that publishers actually uh, actively discourage or prevent machine learning, uh, uh, the sharing of stuff from the literature. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is technology, which is completely open. Anything you see here, uh, you're completely free to use. Um, and at the moment, I'm applying it to the open literature, but it is uh, in uh, principle um, uh, applicable to anything uh, that you can read. Um, so uh, 
the idea is that machines should do all the hard and boring work for you. And I've written a program uh, which is called Amy. I don't know if you can see that, but that is my mascot, Amy, uh, who is uh, this very patient uh, data and text miner. Um, and uh, just to uh, give you context, I've been running a nonprofit company called Content Mind to do this. Um, uh, it's rather um, slowed down because of the epidemic and various things, um, but um, I combine that with uh, working uh, in retirement at the University of Cambridge. Everything here, by the way, is free CC BY. Uh, you can use the slides, you can distribute them, and so on. And I should be uh, thank the people who funded me, uh, Wikimedia, who are very important here, and the Shuttleworth Foundation. So what I've been campaigning for is the right, the legal right, to do what I've been talking about, to extract data from the scientific literature uh, and uh, not be persecuted by people for doing it. We have about here uh, probably 3 million uh, scientific articles a year. Um, there's well over 100 million scientific articles. Uh, and so finding the little nuggets of gold in there uh, is getting more and more difficult. And I'm sure you all share that problem. So I've been campaigning uh, to mine this uh, and uh, for you to have the right to do this. Now, over the last 12 months, I started working on climate change. Uh, COVID came along and knocked that off. So at the moment, most of my effort is on mining um, information for viral epidemics. Um, and so if you, um, uh, if you see th re references to viruses and so on, you'll understand why. Um, so uh, these are some of the people, volunteers, who are working uh, in this area at the moment. Uh, and then I've uh, mentioned Matthew as well. So we have two main existential problems. One is open, but one is virus. Uh, that will kill a lot of people, but it won't kill humanity and it won't kill the planet. But what's coming up is climate change. And if we don't do something now, it will kill humanity. Um, uh, and the reports we see get worse rather than better. And much of the information we need is in the published scientific literature, but most of it is behind paywalls. So, I was working with Simon Worthington in Germany on this. He does open science. Um, and then uh, we were getting up to speed uh, and COVID hit us. So we decided to change our strategy to COVID. Now, this happened five years ago. The Ebola epidemic uh, hit West Africa and 11,000 uh, 11, people died. But it was actually forecast 35 years ago in the scientific literature. So my argument is maybe there are things in the scientific literature now which could help us deal with COVID. Uh, maybe treatments, uh, maybe it was protected, maybe we can expect other um, animals or countries or uh, comorbidities or anything like that. And maybe it's out there at the moment. So here's the paper, uh, 37, 38 years ago. Uh, and this basically, as you can see, um, uh, sorry, I am. Um, uh, if you can see here, a single sentence, active cases of uh, Ebola or Mar Marburg virus have never been reported from Liberia. But this paper seems to indicate that Liberia has to be included in the Ebola virus endemic zone. So that's actually very easy to understand. Um, and this is our simplest form of uh, text, mar text mining. I've done a lot of text mining, especially for chemistry. But here, we're just going to be looking for words. So if you found those words, um, then you can make the assumption without any sophisticated software. So our role uh, is simply to uh, identify those um, words in the literature on a massive scale. 
Okay, here are some of the people who are helping. Uh, this is at the National Institute for Plant Genome Research in uh, Delhi. And we've got really exciting community of interns. Uh, we've got uh, seven master's students in Delhi. Well, they're not in Delhi. They're all over India because they are also um, locked down. And today we got five new young scientists from the Indian National Academy of Young Scientists. Uh, and they're just starting to help us here. So we've got about 15 people volunteering from India on this project. It's very exciting and it shows um, that this is accessible to anybody. You don't have to have a PhD to do this sort of thing. So how does it work? Uh, well, basically, we find the material, some millions of papers. We have to scrape it, which is horrible. Uh, we have to clean it because uh, these papers are not easy for machines to read. We have to annotate it which you'll see in a minute, which means that we have to identify the components um, and we have to display or publish it. And basically at this stage, uh, you can then start doing machine learning on it and so on. So this is all really, really boring. Um, and um, I spend my time doing really, really boring stuff so that uh, hopefully other people don't have to do it. Um, so just uh, uh, we scrape. Uh, we clean it, and uh, we take dictionaries to annotate it and analyze it. Where are our sources? Well, the problem is that open access, despite what people say, is still very much in the minority. Um, in some subjects, and that's certainly true for materials, over 90% of the material is actually paywalled. Uh, so only academics can read it, and only certain academics you know, those who um, happen to be in rich universities, but not if you're in the global south. Uh, we have a good resource in the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, BioArchive and MedArchive are really coming up, um, uh, particularly with uh, COVID. And in the UK, we have um, 100,000 theses in the British Library. I'm also working with uh, Mexico and Latin America in general, who are doing a great job of all of this. Um, and I know that uh, Trinity College Dublin is one of the dep deposition libraries for um, new publications. So I would be very interested in seeing if um, Ireland wished to take this forward. You'll see in a minute that Ireland and UK are now different on the copyright front. Uh, because unfortunately we are leaving the EU. I won't say more about that except to say I'm devastating. Uh, but um, there is a role for uh, both our countries uh, and their libraries to work on this. Okay, just to refresh your idea, uh, Clyde took 4 million uh, journals from the um, British Library and looked for viral epidemics uh, sorry, this is in sorry, this is in the um, thesis, 100,000 theses, and found 45 hits. So that's the sort of reason you may need machines. And Clyde's done the same thing on open access journals. So we're looking for a very small amount. I don't know what the percentage of materials is in the literature. It's probably less than one percent. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, uh, you absolutely need machines to find it. And I shall show you that. So here's our pipeline. Scrape, clean, annotate, display. And this is a tool called um, NIME uh, here. Some of you may actually use NIME. It was developed in Constance for uh, chem informatics. Um, and uh, it allows you to build a graphical pipeline here. So uh, this is query coming in. You can get the web pages, you can split them, turn it into HTML, uh, extract with XPath, which is an HTML searching tool, uh, turn it into text, and then put it in a document viewer. And that's only a small part of the workflow. So putting this workflow together is really important. Um, and these are some of the tools, I'm not going to uh, go through them, uh, that we use. 
So Amy wants to say hello again. So there's Amy. Amy is also a, a workflow for this sort of thing. So we talked about um, uh, we talked about annotation, and one of the things uh, that is really key now is uh, Wikipedia. Uh, if I was in an audience, I'd ask people to uh, to put their hands up and say how many people have um, used um, a, a Wikipedia. Most hands would go up. Uh, it's now accepted to use Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is, in my view, the biggest knowledge re revolution in the last 20 years. It is uh, absolutely all-encompassing and so on. Um, and uh, it has now been um, added to by Wikidata, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, which is the data which is essentially extracted from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, there's much more than that, but you can think of it in that way. And so what we've been doing is we're building dictionaries, which we call WikiFactMine. So it's an association of uh, Wikimedia and uh, ContentMine. And we make dictionaries for really any subject that we're interested in. So here are some of the ones that I've done in the past uh, related to diseases, epidemics, um, funders, uh, drugs, um, insecticides, but here's chemical elements. So we have a dictionary of chemical elements. And uh, just literally yesterday, I asked Stefano and um, uh, Matthew for some terms they'd like to see in a dictionary. Uh, and they gave me uh, some 20 terms that they'd like to search for. Uh, I made a dictionary and we've got tools which allow you to do this very rapidly and automatically. Again, if I were live, I would demonstrate it. It takes about um, a minute to take those terms. Uh, but what it does is it looks them up in Wikidata. So this term anode uh, is in Wikidata, and it's got a unique identifier, Q181232. Uh, um, and there are, as I say, 100 million things in uh, Wikidata at the moment. Um, here's CASTEP. So CASTEP has got a unique identifier, um, and we'll look at that in a minute. But you can see here, for example, uh, the country. So we're using countries for um, uh, analyzing viruses. But in the same way, you can also uh, use countries for materials. So. Here's a typical uh, paper. Now, I've only worked with open access papers uh, because um, if I use closed access uh, papers and publish results, then the university will be cut off uh, brutally by the publishers. Uh, so um, I don't do that because um, uh, I'm developing the technology. I hope that you will want to do this as a result of your um, uh, uh, what I'm presenting here, uh, but you need to be aware that this is something which uh, needs to be dealt with rather cautiously because of the opposition from the publishers. And the reason that they oppose it is they want to own the whole of the scientific literature and charge the world for everything in it. Um, uh, they don't do anything valuable, but they are now the gatekeepers. So, we can search, uh, we've got a tool called Get Papers. You can search for lithium ion battery uh, and you get uh, 3,300 open access results. Now I should stress that these are only the open access ones in the biological si sciences. If we look at the closed access one, I would expect us to have probably at least 10 and probably 50 times more. So I'd expect 100,000 uh, papers here, something of that sort. Uh, but um, I'm just using these as an example. This is a typical um, uh, paper here. This is what we call the bibliography. Um, and uh, then if we look at the paper, you can see running text here. This is a text, a uh, bit of text here. And then there are the figures in the text. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, probably for most of the rest of the talk. So um, here's uh, 
uh, a figure. This is a schematic figure, and you can see uh, that it contains uh, electron, uh, sorry, micrographs of various sorts. This is common. But this is the real stuff that we want to mine here, which um, Matthew and I are working on. And I've given uh, two examples here. One is uh, an X-ray uh, diffraction diagram. Um, and if any of you are out there, then uh, we'd be very happy to help work on extracting X-ray data. Um, I'm a crystallographer myself, so um, uh, although we have databases of powder diffraction, they're not complete. Um, and as I'll show in a minute, we can actually turn this uh, PDF um, image into machine-readable data. Uh, this is what um, Matthew's interested in, the uh, cyclic fault hammergrams, um, uh, potential against current. Um, and in this particular case, you've got two curves um, uh, for uh, two different morphologies of manganese oxide um, uh, and so on. And we'll show that you can actually extract data from both of these. And here is a charge discharge uh, plot, similar to what Matthew was talking about. And here you can see that the authors have given five uh, different um, uh, traces, um, uh, which um, you know they've been uh, uh, running at different times or different amounts of exhaustion. So first about uh, Wikimedia. I've mentioned Wikipedia and Wikidata, but uh, Wikidata contains information on virtually everything uh, that is open and can be categorized. So here's CASTEP. I'm sure most of you know this is a computational chemistry um, code. You know, I've worked with the developers, Mike Payne and others, in the Cavendish at Cambridge. Um, and you can see here that Wikidata has given it a unique identifier. So that relates, sorry, that relates to CASTEP and nothing else. Uh, so you can actually put that into Google and it'll tell you it's CASTEP. You can see here uh, 88 million items uh, in virtually anything. Um, and here you can see it tells you that CASTEP was created in the condensed matter group, uh, was written in Fortran, and this is where you can find it. So I believe that Wikidata is going to become the single stop for the world's metadata. You want to find out what Trinity College Dublin is, you look in Wikidata. You want to look and find out um, you know, what uh, the commonest bird is in Ireland, um, and uh, it will tell you in Wikidata. You want to find out what the um, Hindi name for Ireland is, and you can find that in Wikidata. And you can find it literally within seconds. So just make that mental swap that this is the first place to look for well-established um, concepts. Okay, so what we've done here is we have downloaded our um, 200 articles. I haven't said very much about how we do the download. That's another paper which Rick Smith Anna wrote for us called Get Papers. And you simply type the query, and I'll go back two slides. Uh, here's the query. Um, you put in lithium uh, ion battery, and it's going to download those to your machine. Now, we normally stop at 200. Uh, which we can do in, um, you know, a minute or so. You get 10, uh, you get, um, 10 uh, a second on my home broadband at the moment. So you can easily download 1,000 in a few minutes and so on. Um, and so we downloaded those, and then we asked, what is in those papers? And what we've done is we've made these dictionaries. Now, remember... Uh, we've made a dictionary for countries, you've seen that. We've got a dictionary for materials. And for a talk I gave a year ago, we got a dictionary on magnetism. So I thought I'd throw that in as well and see if, if any of these things have magnetic properties. We also got uh, chemical elements here, um, and you can see them down here. Uh, and we've got... Um, funders, because this can be very useful to find out who's sponsoring the research 
and so on. And you can put literally anything in here. You could put in, um, uh, you know, Irish universities. Uh, you could put in lighthouses. You could put in anything uh, that is categorized. Okay, so you can see how it um, uh, puts the results here. Um, you've got all of the ele chemical elements with the score. Uh, we're still looking for a better display. This is quite adequate, but it would be nice to have a better JavaScript um, display. Uh, I just don't have time to do it myself. So if anybody likes um, displaying data with things like D3 or um, R or whatever, uh, the data is all in a form where you can do this. Uh, then you can see uh, these are the terms here for materials which uh, Stefano and um, uh, and Matthew contributed. So capacity, electrode, anode, coating, current density, and so on. So the interesting thing was that actually their terms were so well chosen that almost all the entries here um, had those included. So that means that they would be a very good set of terms to go out and look in the literature for battery materials. If you're allowed to look at the full text, then that's a way of retrieving them. And then this final thing here is a word cloud. Um, it tells you those terms which occur most frequently. So you can see this one's about titanium oxide, but this one's about purpurin. Uh, scientific papers, if something is important in a paper, it's normally mentioned many times. So um, uh, the fact that we get 71 mentions means almost certainly that paper is interesting, uh, is interested in purpurin. OK, and here we can do uh, something simple like co-occurrence of words. So this is co-occurrence in the document. Um, and you can see here how often uh, the elements occur. Not surprisingly, lithium is the um, uh, commonest. Uh, but you can see here that people are interested in cobalt, manganese, nickel and sulfur. We haven't told it uh, to look for those. That's uh, what is actually in those papers, um, you know, because the authors put uh, those things in. And you can see here, these are um, the contributed dictionary, and these terms are all, uh, you know, highly represented in that. We can look and see which countries are most represented, China, Germany, Japan. Uh, Ireland is on the list, and in fact, the United Kingdom is lower than Ireland. But I think that's because uh, people probably don't use it in the text. They might call it uh, Britain or England or God knows what, right? Um, and then here's magnetism. And you can see a few of these amorphous, annealing, hysteresis, and so on. Now, that's at the document level, but we can actually drill down to the sentence level. Uh, and uh, we're developing uh, software. So you can actually say where in the document you find it. So um, the method section would tell you how you did something and, and what you did, um, whereas the introduction would tell you what had been done before the study, um, and the funder section would tell you who funded it. So we've got a very precise um, microscope into the paper. Now, a huge amount of science is published as diagrams. And universally and tragically, these diagrams are put into PDFs. They're first of all put into um, bitmaps, and then they're put into PDFs, which is about the uh, most effective way of destroying scientific information. Think back, those of you who are crystallographers know that this is actually produced by a machine. Uh, it comes out as a file, uh, a CIF file, C-I-F, um, and all the manufacturers support it. And why in the world people don't publish their raw data, I don't know, because it's actually more effort to do this sort of thing than it is just to put the data files out. And I've been trying for 25 years to get people to publish data, and maybe one time Sometime it will happen, but at the moment, unfortunately, we have to scrape it out of the literature, which means we lose stuff, but nevertheless, uh, it's a lot better than having nothing. 
So here, we're actually fairly fortunate. This is the picture here. This is the diagram. Uh, this is the uh, Bragg angle up here. And this is arbitrary units of intensity. And these are two different materials, so actually two morphologies of this manganese oxide. Um, and um, uh, what you can see here is uh, down here, the peaks, which is an annotation of the diagram. Um, because they're blue and red, and that's a very valuable thing, we can actually extract the blue um, uh, stuff with Amy software uh, automatically. So everything you see from now on is automatic. I haven't told it to do anything here. It goes to this diagram. It says there are three different colors in here, um, apart from white, uh, black, red, and, uh, and uh, blue. And I will extract all of those. So here's the blue trace. Here's the black trace. And then uh, we've got to find out what the angle is. And here, uh, this is optical character recognition, OCR, of uh, the stuff in this diagram here. And you can see it's done a perfect job of pulling out uh, the angles. It's got that wrong. That should be two theta, but lots of uh, systems um, don't have um, uh, Greek in it very well. Um, and um, you can even see that it's pulled out alpha manganese oxide, PDF file, and it's got the number right. The only thing it didn't get right uh, is the subscript two there. Now, that means we have to fill some of these things with heuristics or machine learning, but it's, it's not an impossibility. So what we can do there to a high degree of uh, accuracy is we can come out with something which is a probably about um, 500 data points along this axis, which is probably good enough for most experiments. Uh, and you can do things, peach shake analysis, uh, or you can look for uh, minor components or whatever it is uh, that you're interested in. Here's another one. This is one of the ones I showed from Matthew. Um, and here's our uh, plot. And because they've done it nicely in different colors, we can pull the five different colors out. I've only shown two of them and the black. So the blue one here, uh, those are all the blue pixels. Here's the green. You can see all the green pixels. And here's the black pixels. Now, none of them are perfect, but I'm developing software which will join the dots here. So you can have pretty good confidence um, in uh, what those curves actually are. So I'm going to now show you a curve which uh, was completely extracted. And this is our cyclic voltammogram. Um, and you can see here that it's got um, a red curve and a black curve. And if we uh, take this and we extract the red pixels, we actually get a complete curve, uh, nothing missing. So that goes straight to Matthew uh, as uh, something which he can then compute his other properties from. Uh, this has got arbitrary units at the moment, but I, I have software which will uh, read this scale and convert these into um, uh, user coordinates. So that's not a problem. It'll take a day or so, but the, the codes will be written. So here we can take that and we now have a, a pretty good voltammogram, which I hope is good enough for uh, some of the purposes Matt wants. And here uh, is the other curve. Now you can see it's got bits missing, but uh, I think we'll be able to join that up uh, by various heuristics. Hum, right. So, all looking good up until that point. And now we have the problem that you will have zillions of papers. Uh, the system is aimed at having the papers on your desk. So, many of you, uh, and again, if I was in an, with an audience, I'd ask you, how many of you have got more than 10,000 PDFs on your machine? And some hands would go up. I know somebody who's got 500,000 PDFs on their machine. Uh, so an awful lot of the world's literature is actually on your desktops um, or equivalent. And so the AMI system 
is aimed at reading what is on your desktop. You don't have to spend your time going back to the publishers and telling them what you're doing or whatever. You've got the stuff on your desktop and you can mine it there and so on. And I would say in general, um, uh, this is something where you don't broadcast to the world uh, what you've got here. Um, and you don't necessarily even talk to your library about it. It's a natural right of people to do this. Well, because it's a natural right, um, we've been trying to reform the copyright law to allow people to do it. And this is my great friend and colleague, Julia Reda, who was a member of the European Parliament for many years, uh, six, I think, and she spearheaded the reform of copyright in the European Union, uh, and the UK was part of it at that stage. Unfortunately, there was a huge push from the rights holders, uh, and it has now got probably worse than before rather than better. I mean, Julia uh, fought her heart out uh, to do this, and she's still doing so uh, from um, the Shuttleworth Foundation, but the publishers have ceaselessly lobbied um, uh, the lawmakers in Brussels to make it almost impossible to get a clear permissive law on this. Now, I believe that uh, we do have the legal right to do it, but the people doing it uh, will have to be brave and be prepared to, um, uh, you know, uh, challenge this. You can see here, See this phrase, much of the current and future development in artificial intelligence. Uh, this um, uh, article up here, by the way, my slides get put up on slide share so you can read that. Um, this article will uh, give a good indication of what the European Directive does. And so much of the current and future development in artificial intelligence depends on text and data mining. That's the key thing. And we have to face up to it because otherwise what will happen is we will only be able to do text and data mining uh, if Elsevier allows it or actually they will do it and stop us doing it uh, and say that what they're doing is for the benefit of all subscribers. So it's really important that we uh, challenge uh, the current situation. And by the way, uh, this is uh, Julia running content mine software um, four years ago. So these are the um, uh, things you can look up on. I shall put it up on slideshow share. I've got lots of people to thank. I thank most of them um, at the beginning. Um, but uh, what I'm really interested here is seeing if uh, from this sort of shopping list that I've uh, put in front of you, whether there are people who are interested in extracting information from the literature. And these are very broad and powerful techniques, particularly uh, in physical sciences. So I'll leave it there uh, and see if we've got any questions. Uh, yeah, my mic is on. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thanks a million. And, um... Uh, so, um, so this is the kind of awkward moment because nobody can, nobody clap. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm used to that. <laughs> that. That's the way we live in. Um, so, actually, so these, there are quite a few questions already on the on the chat box. So, I, I maybe just go in order as as, as I see them. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Vincent Chung, um, I, I, I'm afraid I don't know where you are, but um, he's asking. Um, uh, about the cleaning and annotating step, uh, uh, and uh, essentially uh, the question is uh, uh, whether there are different models to do these steps depending on the publisher. So I guess uh, is, is you adapt to the publisher style? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, it's one of the most uh, challenging things we have to um, uh, deal with. So here, um, and I will share, are my chats, is it still sharing or not? Uh, yeah, we see that, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll make it, I'll uh, increase it. Um, I'll leave it like this because the, the point is clear. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, there are people who are um, uh, uh, seeing it on YouTube. Okay, this is, um, uh, this is a, uh, basically from a Biomed Central publisher. They've been bought by Springer, 
um, and they have a particular style here. Um, and um, you can tell a lot by heuristics and machine learning, but uh, there are still things that you have to do yourself. So here, for example, their abstract is wrapped in a little box. Uh, that actually makes it easier uh, to know what's in the abstract, but um, you have to uh, put that in. So basically, I'm trying to develop style sheets for every publisher. Now, uh, many publishers publish all their journals in the same style. So this is um, uh, this is um, uh, Biomed Central Springer, um, and um, that means that if we solve it for this journal, then we've solved it for uh, many, many other um, uh, publishers. But some, uh, like um, Elsevier and Wiley, have society journals. So uh, Elsevier uh, publication generally is different from Cell Press um, uh, and so forth. So uh, it's a big problem. It's something which can be solved by communal contributions uh, or by um, essentially um, semi-supervised machine learning. So to take, take a corpus like this and get an idea as to the variability of these pages uh, would give us a lot. So I would be optimistic that we could solve this in a, you know, a few months if um, uh, people wanted to communicate and a bit longer if it was left just to me. Um, I have a, maybe uh, before I leave the next question, a, a question myself, which is related to, to this one here. So I guess one thing is uh, the style, uh, the kind of editorial style on which the, you know, the actual physical uh, uh, article is, is written. But what about the, the more kind of semantic different style? So, so I guess uh, if I take a journal like, I don't know, a letter format and tend to be like a, a narrative of a story while... Uh, Maybe something which is, uh, uh, I don't know, physical review B, for instance, is more uh, data oriented. So, would this actually create a problem in, in mining information? Uh, well, there are a few journals which are semantic. Um, and uh, the International Union of Crystallography has done a first class job in making its journals semantic using the SIF, the SIF protocol. So, uh, these are the exception rather than the rule. Mm. But um, uh, hopefully, we can gradually pers persuade others to do it. Um, it depends very much on the journal. So let's say that um, we take this. I don't know if you can see it. Um, this is running text. The cell volume of urchin like MNO2 is 274.02 cubic angstroms. Now, that sentence is independent of the publisher, almost certainly. Um, that, um, uh, so the text that the author produces uh, will have many things in which is not dependent on the publisher. On the other hand, uh, the publisher produces things like, uh, in these pictures here, is the caption at the bottom uh, or at the top of the picture. Uh, how many panels are there? Um, uh, in this and so on. Um, and then uh, you find that when you come to references, uh, they indent them or they outdent them and so on. I think, uh, you know, these are gradually being solved um, uh, and so on. Uh, hopefully, it only needs to be done about once and then, you know, a few, uh, you know, a few percent every year after something of that sort. But it is a major problem, and I would very much uh, welcome uh, anyone who wants to help with it. Okay. Um, now, so there's another question still from, from Vincent, as he's asking um, if, if overall so there's a difference in, in quality between papers uh, uh, behind paywall or papers that are, uh, feature in uh, open access uh, uh, outlets. And... Um, and I guess he mentioned, uh, he mean actually whether, I mean, in terms of quality of the content. Right. So, um, the, the, this is a complex, it's a good question, a complex one. Authors create data on machines normally. So the tragedy is that these things here are all ultimate, originally data files. Some publishers will publish the raw data, 
some publishers require you to turn data into bitmaps. Some people will do it. So these are bitmaps uh, in this particular journal. But if you send them a, um, uh, an e EPS file, extended postscript, uh, then that may very well come through as a vector file. And vectors are much more valuable than bitmaps. You can get thousands rather than hundreds of data points yes. out of that. Uh, I know the American Chemical Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry automatically turn everything into bitmaps, even if it comes in as vectors. Uh, then there is the supplemental information or supporting information, and many chemists publish this, particularly spectra and uh, reactions, uh, sometimes crystallography, and that can be 500, up to 500 pages of um, PDF. Now, that is almost always untouched by the journal, so that the quality of that depends on the author. I would say, to a first approximation, that um, apart from semantic journals, like Actua Crystallographica, but apart from that, the quality of the data depends largely on the author, uh, but it is destroyed by publishers' processes, uh, which are independent of whether they're open or closed access. However, some publishers make it very difficult to find open content. So if you publish a um, crystal structure, you are required to deposit it um, in the public domain, and authors do that, but it gets sent uh, by the pub many publishers to the, inter uh, to the Cambridge Crystallographic Database. Mm. I have no role in that, although I worked uh, 50 meters from them. Uh, they then put it behind an access wall, and most of the published crystallography is only accessible by uh, a contract with the uh, Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. Now, I personally think this is uh, quite unacceptable, um, but uh, the publishers do it because it's convenient and um, most academics don't care because uh, their institution subscribes uh, mm -hmm. to the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. But it means that the third world, the global south, is deprived of all of this information in general terms. Sometimes there are ad hoc contracts, but in general, uh, this information is uh, essentially deliberately hidden by the publication process. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, now I have uh, a question from uh, Luke uh, Gilligan. Um, so he's a PhD student in my own group. And uh, he's asking what, uh, um, what uh, character recognition engine is uh, Amy using? That's a very good question. Um, so there, uh, there are, if you like, easy characters and uh, difficult characters. Uh, if we look at this text here, you may not see it. It's running text here. You have uh, the normal, um, I'll call them uh, ASCII characters. Um, letters, numbers, uh, and a few symbols, um, some superscripts here, uh, subscripts, and so on. If you look at mathematics, you start to get Greek symbols. Uh, and if you look at things in uh, Hindi, then you will get them in uh, De uh, Devanagara script and so on. There have been OCR engines developed for these. So, um, some of them uh, do better than others, but in general, anything that goes beyond normal um, uh, 0 to uh, 127 characters, that's the, the normal ANSI range, anything beyond that is likely to give problems. It's not just because of the characters, it's also the positioning of the characters. So here, you know, that says there minus one, uh, you'll actually find that it gets interpreted not as minus one, but as m dash one. Mm. So the difference between a minus and an m dash uh, is uh, difficult, and, and the machines often assume the other. Uh, have we got? We don't actually have any uh, Greek characters here. Greek characters are medium supported, but the whole range of things like um, uh, you know nablas and um, 
uh, all the rest of it are very likely to be unsupported. Um, we do have tricks for this, but you know uh, um, they're difficult. Now, if they're in running text, uh, increasingly publishers use Unicode, which means that you can work that character out. So in running text here, you're okay. In diagrams, uh, it's a lottery. And, and so, so, so the issue of recognizing uh, subscript and superscript and so on is not an issue of the resolution of the of the text. is is an issue of, of, of really the process of recognizing characters. Uh, am I yes. right? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Luke is also asking a second question, and um, uh, I mean, how how you go about correcting mistake by misinterpreting subscript and superscripts uh, and, 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 and characters that has ambiguity, say? Right. A very good question again. Um, that all machine learning, all natural language processing has an error rate, right? The normal way to detect these is to have a ground truth. And in this area, we've actually got quite a lot of different ground truths. So... Let us say that we are. Um, uh, let's say that we are uh, reading this um, voltage curves of MNO subscript to anode um, in the potential range of uh, 0.01 to 3.60 uh, volts. Um, if there are errors in this, it might lead to things which are meaningless. So, in other words, if it comes out in so. 0.01 as 0.0, letter O1, that will be clearly not a number. And so you can pick up that sort of thing. Secondly, if this came out as, um, let's just say, 9.01 uh, to uh, 3.60, you'd know that it didn't make sense because it was um, a range where the minimum was higher than the maximum, and so forth. And you get stock. Uh, things. So here we've got um, uh, millivolts sec to the minus one. Now that will be a very common um, unit in here, and um, so you can uh, you can uh, do it by a Levenstein distance. You can say how many characters agree in this. What's it most likely to be, um, uh, uh, and so on. So we can get the confidence here quite high. Probably the thing, the most um, serious problem we encounter is bad diagrams. Uh, these diagrams are actually very good, but I've looked at things where uh, humans cannot read them. And if a human, I, I tell you, people will publish diagrams where the lettering is unreadable. Uh, and if humans can't read it, then machines can't read it either. Although they can probably make a better guess in some case than the humans because they've got domain knowledge, um, and so forth. So I think in material science, uh, there's a pretty high quality of rendering diagrams. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions on the chat box. So I have a question myself, and in the meantime, sure. anybody else want to add, um, I'll, I'll read it later on. So actually, I, I have a curiosity about this figure four um, that you show here with... Um, um, uh, we um, Volto, uh, uh, Voltogram. Um, so, so here, so you you show an example where you extract the, the purple and then the green curve here. Um, now, how do you know what correspond to what? So, I guess this correspond to different condition or different. Uh, I'm not sure actually what distinguishes the green from the blue, but how do you correlate? Uh, the information, I mean, essentially, there should be a caption somewhere that I think tell you what the color means, right? There is, right? So this um, uh, this has a caption here. Uh, sorry, that's, that. okay. My apologies, the caption got muddled up. I corrected it, uh, but um, I didn't correct it uh, uh, in this particular slide. So I'm now going to... Um, uh, Try and find the um, uh, try and find the um, the paper and see. Um, right, it oh, reads yeah, it charge right. discharge specific capital. Right, right. A caddis-like clue 
uh, and B, urchin-like sample. So that, A, is, I, I don't know what these terms mean. I look for them. I think they're only used by this author or something like this, um, unless you tell me differently. But they're a morphology. So in this, we would have, um, we can label A as Cadiz-like clue. And if we're fortunate, we can put that in a dictionary and so on. In this, this is a particular, uh, this is a fairly common type of diagram. Uh, so we can actually say that this belongs to a class of diagrams where um, uh, these uh, uh, materials are being systematically varied here. Now, I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, Matthew, do you know why the diff what leads to these different curves? Uh, these, uh, I think these are actually for different cycles, probably. Yes, I agree. They're yeah. cycles of some form. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, because you're seeing a reduction in capacity, you know, you have the largest capacity for the first cycle that's mm. labelled on that black curve yeah. and then it reduces two to five. And the good news is that a, a discipline, a community, will converge on a way of doing things. So, um, since there are a lot of these in the literature, what will happen is, you know, you've got a graduate student told to plot this, they'll go off to the literature, they'll see what other people have done, uh, and they will copy it, right? Or they've got a bit of software uh, which produces this, and they'll all use the same uh, set of software and so on. So um, we found that there are normally three or four different flavors of these sorts of things because of the software that's used and uh, and what you know, what people um, uh, have looked at elsewhere. So I'd be surprised if we didn't find that things like this two to five arrow were common, um, uh, and that we can certainly label them as one to five without knowing what they are. Um, it can be difficult to go back to the original text and find it. And you're right that that is a that is a challenge. Um, and, and one that, um, you know, I'm conscious of and working on. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so I don't see any further questions, so maybe we can uh, uh, maybe uh, wrap up the talk and, and close here. Um, so I, I would like to thank both of you again and uh, all, all, all of you out there for listening. And um, um, so for, for those of you who are following this series, so we take a break next week, but then we will become be back the week the week after week after. Uh, thanks a million again. Thanks very much, Stefan. Thanks. I will put these up on SlideShare, and if you have a URL for the um, YouTube, that would be very valuable because I could then uh, put that into the slides as well. Yeah.